Lord, as we gather in your name again today for worship, we're mindful of your grace and mercy. Um, What we pray, God, is that uh, the name of Jesus would be ever before us, uh, directing our thoughts um, at the same time that we would uh, center in on that name in in such a way that opens us to your spirit. Uh, We're we're a work of transformation and change uh, either begins or continues. Uh, What we ultimately want is for your, your the kingdom of your gospel to, to be established inside of our hearts, inside of our families, our relationships, um, inside this place, in, inside the world. And we, we know that you're not a violator of one's will, uh, which means that you, you wait patiently for our participation. And so this morning we want to yield to that in, in every way, and in any way that is needed uh, so that ultimately the name of Jesus not just reigns, but the name of Jesus uh, is ever before us. So guide us in that process and and this act, that experience, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Now, many of you know that throughout the summer we're looking at different verses or, or, or passages in the Bible that are favorites of people. Uh, a few months ago, uh, just randomly sent out some notices and asked people to respond back, giving me the, giving me their favorite Bible verses, the ones that uh, or this the, the the hallmarks for them, the ones that they they love, that they constantly go back and and read and reflect on, and and throughout the summer we're taking different uh, different ones, different people's Bible verses that are passages that are their most favorite and using them to direct us in our summer sermon series. Now, last week I have to tell you, when I said, say summer sermon series 15 times fast, I don't know if you heard, but there was someone that was in close to, to, the, close to me that all of a sudden heard, I did it! And, uh, and so the mom looked down at the child and said, uh, what did you do? You know, I mean, just like, oh, no. And she said, well, I did exactly what he said. I said it 10 times as fast as I could. So this is our summer summer sermon series, Uh, just looking at different favorite persons, Bible verses. And this week will be in a continuation of that. Now, about 15 years ago, uh, I was serving a church, and my superintendent, again, superintendents in the Methodist church, is we we have an Episcopal leader that is called our bishop, and the bishop, uh, he... Uh, or she has a cabinet, and the cabinet uh, is made up of different superintendents. They are regional or area overseers, managers uh, of, of, of just a set group of churches. And at this time, we were living in the middle of the state, and my superintendent at that time was a guy by the name of Brad Brady. Now, some of you know Brad. He's been a part of our conference for probably going on about 40 years of ministry. And Brad, one of the hallmarks of his ministry, He's famous for these truisms, these sayings that uh, he's sort of a master of understatement, and he, he, he would say something, and all of a sudden you think about it, and you go, gosh, that, that's, that's very accurate, that's very true. And, and one of the truisms is, um, there we go, uh, is everywhere I go, I show up. Now, that almost sounds like it's a no-brainer, and uh, I remember the first time, he said that in the meeting, um, I, I was familiar with the concept. I've always been a fan of a guy by the name of Thomas Merton. And Thomas Merton uh, wrote extensively about reflective leadership. He, he wrote a great deal about ref, uh, reflective prayer. Uh, his, I, would, I would argue his most famous book is a book that's called No Man is an Island. And, and respect, reflective leadership or reflective prayer what that's about is about what's going on inside of you, not so much about what's going on with other people, not so much what's going on with, uh, with a, a situation or a relationship, because you cannot control other people. You cannot control the things that go on outside of you. What you have a direct influence upon, and, and, and many would argue what you can control, it's what's going on inside of me or what's going on inside of you. And so the No Man is an Island book is about that. He writes about 
what it's like to look inward. I mean, if you want to affect change in the life of, of a relationship or reflect change in the life of a situation, or whether at work or whether it be professionally or, or personally, whether it be public or, or, or private, it, you, you have to look first inside. And, and Thomas Merton was about that. And, and the idea of everywhere I go, I show up is an acknowledgement that when Shane walks into a room or Shane is engaged in a relationship, everything that makes Shane, Shane, that shows up. The things that I like, the things that I think I'm good at or or good with, uh, that shows up. But then all those other parts that are in the process, I'm hopefully of maturing or changing or transforming, you know, uh, that shows up too. And so one of his famous little truisms uh, is, everywhere I go, I show up. Good, bad, or indifferent, it comes with me whether I like it or not. I, I was familiar with that. Now, he, he said something else that I uh, have always thought of too, and that is, if I can't improve the wisdom in the room, I want you to sit with that. If I can't improve the wisdom in the room, then I don't need to say anything. All right, so there's a lot of wisdom in the room. Thanks for coming. God bless you. See you all later. I don't have anything else to say. But, but, the, uh, but there's something to that. Um, now, I, I remember also the first time that he mentioned uh, this truism to me. And, and it's something that I've come to embrace, and I hope that it's something that I practice. Uh, I think the book of James, James would agree with this. So our text this morning is about wisdom. And this, this, he writes, James writes a fair amount about wisdom, particularly in chapter 3. And so our passage this morning comes from James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. And James writes, Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter, en- if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. So James is writing about this wisdom. And and you need to know a little bit about the context uh, of the setting of James chapter 3. Some of you who are familiar with James chapter 3, and and you know that he addressed, at least in in the chapter, about those that he calls teachers or those who are influencers. Some Bibles say teachers, some Bibles say influencers or some some that are in leadership but all of us are a teacher or an influencer or a leader in some form or fashion if you influence another person guess what chapter three is written to you you don't necessarily have to be a teacher in a church or, or a teacher professionally if you can influence another friend if you can influence uh, in your family, whether it be with children or youth or, or whoever, if, if you can affect some level of change inside the life of another person, whether it be professionally or whether it be personally, public or private, doesn't matter. If you are a Christian, which means you are a follower of Jesus Christ, chapter 3 deals with that, deals with you, because you have the opportunity to influence another person. And so chapter 3 is written to us. And and in chapter 3, there are two vital components, uh, according to James, two things we have to pay attention to uh, when when it comes to being an influence of another person. And and the first one in the beginning of chapter 3, now it's not part of our text, but I want to set the context for you. In the beginning of chapter 3, he says, pay attention to your tongue. Now, I'm sure you were taught uh, as a little boy or a little girl, the same little nursery rhyme that, that I learned very early on. And it's sticks and stones, what? Sticks and stones 
may break my bones, but words will what? Never hurt me. That is a lie. <laughs> you know, it's amazing what we teach our children. I have to go back and talk to my parents and teachers who taught me that, you know. It's a lie. The, the truth is, you can mend from your bones, probably in what, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a month or two. It might take, if ever, a lifetime to get over words. I bet you could close your eyes and just think about the things that have been so uplifting that you've heard, where people were speaking directly to you, or the things that have been so damaging. I bet, I bet you can call that back in a moment's notice. But you might have to go back and think, oh, yeah, I remember when I, I broke my knee, you know, or got stitches here, and I remember failing. And you, have to, you have to go back and even think when and what part of your body. This idea that, that words never hurt, nah, that's not true. Not even close. And, and so when it comes to being an influencer or, or, or leader or teacher in, in any form or fashion, James, what he cautions us is first, pay attention to your words. They, they, are, they are that important. Now, in our text, verses 13 through 18 of that same chapter, the next component of the chapter that's, that he, he highlights is not so much what you say as it is how you live. Now, what I wish James would have done would have said, Hey, Shane, just do this. Make it easy for someone like me. Well, that's not what he does. What, what he does first is he starts with the question, who among you are wise? So just sit with that question for a moment. Do you consider yourself to be wise? Because for James, there's two types of wisdom. There's what we call, and these are my terms, not James's term, what we would call fruitful wisdom. Now, use that word fruit. In, in, in the passage, and then maybe what we would say is unfruitful wisdom. Now, you can say practical wisdom, impractical. You can make it as basic as possible and say good wisdom or, or bad wisdom. The, don't worry about what, what terms you use to, to talk about or to address this dichotomy. But there is an aspect of wisdom that is fruitful, and there is an aspect of wisdom that is not. Now, what James does inform us, which is important, is that to know the difference between fruitful wisdom and unfruitful wisdom is that you have to evaluate the person's deeds, what they're doing or what they've done. See, it's not just the knowledge that a person has, but it's the ability to take that head knowledge, if you grant me those terms, and apply it to a style of life that has as a characteristic good conduct. So if you don't get anything else in this sermon today, this is what I want you to, first, that's what I want you to get. And, and, and that is this, it's not enough to know what to do. Now that's important. You have to know what to do. But it's not enough to, to only know what to do. Equally as important is you have to know how to do it. Because you can know what to do and do it incorrectly. And the sad thing is, is you, you don't need me to tell you this. Somebody's probably applied that level of wisdom in your life. So again, if you don't get anything else, hear this again. It is not enough to know what to do. You have to know how to do it, though that is equally as important. Now, the good news is that James helps us. One of the great things about the book of James, it's very practical. He, he will give you either a thesis or some level of precept or teaching, and then he gives you a great, great deal of, of, of commentary on it. And, and so James, he talks first about this idea of my terms, again, fruitful wisdom. He, wisdom from above, that's, that showed up in the message, uh, in, in the passage. And, and fruitful wisdom 
if you, again, you have to evaluate a person's deeds. You have to evaluate what they're doing as much as what they are saying. And so when you're evaluating either another person's deeds uh, for, and for wisdom's sake or you are evaluating your own deeds, your own sense of self, he, he said first thing you need to look for is that are acts done in or with humility? That's the first clue. And at the, at the same time, he says, do those actions or do those deeds, do, do, they, do, do a person's deed or action, do they lead? Or if you make it plural, do, do, do all those actions lead to peace or righteousness? He says, now if they don't, then you have to go back and look. It's not just enough to know what to do. It's also how do you apply or how do you do what you know needs to be done? Because both of those are important. Are the deeds done in humility? Do they lead to peace, which is a relational term? Or are, are deeds done with consideration of other people? Do they lead to righteousness, not just personal righteousness, but righteousness, maybe corporate righteousness, or righteousness inside the relationship? People who have fruitful wisdom, they do good works in a way that's not designed to bring attention to themselves. To use another biblical word, their, their actions are done either in or with meekness. And you've heard me say this, uh, and I'll, I'll say it until uh, to my dying day. Meekness is not weakness. It is the opposite. It is controlled strength. It is knowing that you have all types of power, but you choose to use them for the benefit of another person as well, not just for your own benefit. And so if we're evaluating either our own deeds or we're evaluating another person's deeds, when it comes to wisdom, what we have to pay attention to is are those deeds done in humility? Do they produce peace? Do they produce righteousness? You know why that's important? Because religious people, hear me on this, because religious people can be arrogant. I know that's a shocker. I mean, the idea that I have the truth, that I, I, I know what to do, I know, I know righteousness, I, I, I know the Bible, I understand my relationship with Jesus Christ. It is such a seductive temptation that happens to every religious person. And there's this voice that yields arrogance. And then what happens, it provokes... Uh, a style of life that defeats the very own goal of what faith in Christ is trying to accomplish and to, and to preach and to yield, which is the gospel. Right views, sound counsel may lose their effect if they're expressed in a way that is self-seeking and produces controversy, which means then those actions will actually drown out the gospel that you are trying to either live or trying to promote. Now, James used this word that's uh, is sort of unique to, to in, in the Greek. It's uh, arethia, and, and the idea is it was first applied. The etymology of the word, which means the history of its meaning, what was first tied to a seamstress. And it's the idea of someone who hired themselves out, who, who had a skill set. They could spin in such a way that either could mend clothing or they could, they could make clothing. And, and, and it's an original definition. It was applied to, uh, to a seamstress. And then over time, the meaning of that word changed. And, and then it became not just tied to, to something to, for a seamstress. It was for anyone who did work solely for what they could get out of it. And then the meaning of the word changed again to the time in, G in Jesus and James' day 
to where it meant not a seamstress, not someone who just did work for what they could get out of it, but it was tied strictly to someone who was in politics, and every action that they created was out of selfish ambition. And so when he's describing this idea of wisdom that is to be done in humility, that yields peace, that yields righteousness, he counters that by saying if you want to know the opposite of that, it's someone who has this level of selfish ambition when it comes to their life. Very specific word used only in James, which when we read the Bible, when we find words like that, our, our minds should go, ooh, wait a minute. This is actually really important. So it's not just knowing what to do, it's knowing how to do it. That's fruitful wisdom. Knowing when to apply what we would call justice. Knowing when to apply forgiveness. Knowing when to make allowances. Knowing when to temper your actions with mercy. James said wisdom that produces peace, that produces harmony, which means it brings people together. It doesn't divide people. It doesn't push people away. That's fruitful wisdom. Now, he goes on to say that now there's another part of wisdom. It's not fruitful wisdom. It's the opposite of that, unfruitful wisdom. Again, my term. And so just as fruitful, wisdoms, fruitful wisdom it, it are, are deeds that are done with humility, in humility, that it produces peace, that it produces righteousness, that it's a controlled type of strength. Says if that's fruitful wisdom, well, then the opposite of that is unfruitful wisdom, and there are deeds that are done uh, in act, with, with envy. They are done in bitterness. They are, they are done with selfishness. And instead of bringing people together when knowing what to do, we do it in a way that produces disorder, disharmony, disunity, instead of bringing people together, instead of creating order, creating harmony. And you see this with people who, for them, when you're around them, and this could even be you, words are filled with harsh criticism, contentiousness, actions produce fighting, Again, James says if you want to know whether it's wisdom, fruitful wisdom, if you want to know it's wisdom, unfruitful wisdom, it's not just what they say, knowing what to do, it's how they do it. Evaluate their deeds, which means for us who have influence and everybody in this room or joining online, you have influence, which means you evaluate your own actions. Do they bring people together? Do they build people up? Do they produce unity and harmony? Or is it criticism? Is it disorder? Is it harming other people? One of the reasons why I love Jesus, I mean, not just the whole Savior of the world, Son of God, yeah, that, that's, that's first and second on the list, okay, you know. But you know what third's on the list? When you read the Gospels, he knew not just what to do, in every situation, how to do it. There, there were times where he had to take a stance that, that was uh, not easy. But he did it with compassion. And then there are other examples where he, he knew exactly how to apply forgiveness. He knew exactly how to apply mercy. He knew exactly how to, how, to, how to illustrate and to introduce grace. He's a master at it. Fruitful wisdom. Not just knowing what to do. It, it's how to do it. That's the task for us. St. Augustine is the father of Western theology, and you're a product of Western theology, all right? 
We're the product of European Christianity, Western theology, not Eastern theology, uh, or Eastern Christianity. We're part of the, the Western side of the church. And, and, and the father behind all that was a guy by the name of St. Augustine. Augustine was a 4th century, late 300s, early 400s, bishop, North African uh, in, in the church. And, and he, he was asked uh, repeatedly, what, what are the, you know, he would, he would travel around speaking, traveling around teaching, and, and, and people would ask him, what, what's the first precept what, uh, of, of your faith, of Christianity? You know what his answer was? Humility. And they said, well, okay, what's the second precept? You know what his answer was? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Humility. You know, what's the third precept? What's the fourth, the fifth? He said, they're all the same. It's humility. See, it's not just having the right answer or knowing what to do. Equally as important, it's how you do it. And James says that's true wisdom. That's wisdom from above. That's faithful wisdom that builds up creates peace, leads to righteousness. Ralph Martin, who's a New Testament scholar, when looking at this text, said the Christian, the follower of Christ. If you don't like that word, that's okay. Follow of Christ, follower of the way, doesn't matter, same thing. You believe in Jesus Christ. He said the Christian is exhorted to be gentle or humble, particular to situations that have the potential for conflict. The life that can be described as both wise and meek, wise and humble, is the one that is under the control of God. Such control results in an attitude that surrenders their sense of self, their selfish rights, and disallows pride that can destroy good relationships with other people. And he's right. So the question before the house, are you wise? That's the question James gives to us. Two types of wisdom. One is fruitful, that not not only knows what to do, but knows how to do it, and does it in such a way that brings people closer that yields itself in peace, that when you evaluate a person's actions, they produce peace, they produce righteousness. That's the wisdom we're after. It's not just knowing what to do. It's knowing how to do it that is equally important. Lord, I, when we look at today in our society that we live in, I, you know, on one level, we're, we're limited with what we know fully about the day-to-day society of the ancient world. And so there's part of us that, that we're all, we, we have to acknowledge that we, we don't know if that type of wisdom was needed as desperately as it's needed today where we seem to pride ourselves on what drives us apart instead of what, even inside the church, instead of what brings us together in unity and in peace and in righteousness. Maybe it is, or maybe it was needed just as much back then as it is needed today. But what we do know is in our day and time, O God, This eternal word that has the ability to breathe in life into every single soul. We need it desperately today. For all of us in this room, oh God, who are influencers, who are teachers, who are leaders, whether it's a... uh, a self-identified term or not, we are. So for all of us, O oh God, 
work in us. The text says it is wisdom that comes from above. Well, that's what we pray for then, God. First, give us clarity to know what to do. And then give us the wisdom, the strength, and the boldness to do it in such a way that it's not just pleasing to you, but makes it easy for people to see Jesus Christ. That's what we want, oh God. And so there are things inside of us that, that just simply need to die, stop, quit. Then that's what we want. And then those things that inside of us that need to be birthed and those things that need to, to grow and to mature, then fan that flame, oh God, so that what is known, witnessed, said about us is that that's fruitful wisdom. They know what to do, and they know how to do it. This we pray in your name. Amen. Our closing song is Build My Life. As you are able, please stand and join us in singing Build My Life.